Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, it's our July mailbag where we talk about recasting a mortgage, how to calculate RMDs, and more. Stick around. That's coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Craftwork Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed. And please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. Looking good, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. It's been, uh, I, yeah, I can't believe we're past the 4th of July already. That's wild. Um, happens to also be my birthday, but, uh, yeah, I, I was hoping that the birthday would just kind of like slide on past this year for whatever reason I wasn't excited about it, but we're past it. And yeah, I feel like that's kind of the demarcation line to like the second half of summer. Like it feels like we're, we're on the backslide already. It can, it goes quick. I know it's been flying. It's it's crazy to think about kind of fall around the corner and winding up summer plans. Still need to hit the beach. I mean, July has just become more exciting for me because I've ended up in a dispute with my landlord, which I'm sure they don't listen to this show or even know that we produce it. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with my housing situation over the next one to three months. Yeah. I, I asked you about that right before we hit record. I'm I'm on the edge of my seat. I love listening to your stories about housing. Well, it's wild. And I I ultimately want to cover this in like a more detailed show. And I'm maybe our listeners are totally tired of hearing about this, or maybe they're they're fascinated and it's like a soap opera that never ends. But so essentially I'm buying a property that's new construction. So it's supposed to be done in September. And I let the landlord know of this current place that I was going to be leaving and I wanted to extend my lease until the end of October, just in case they don't finish it perfectly on time. But the walls are already up, the drywall is being done. Like I think they're going to be fairly close to timing unless something major happens. So this notice corresponded with when the end of my current lease was. So it was rolling over anyway. And so in theory, we could have had to renegotiate the pricing. And I was hoping they would just let me stay. Without saying a word and actually negotiating the pricing, they sent over an extension document and took the, took the rent up by 9% for the final three months. Like a fairly big increase. And I'm livid, like really furious about it. Uh, I'm furious about the way they've handled it. And I think that they think I'm on the ropes here because I'm buying a place. It's not ready yet. And he knows that. And I think he's trying to screw me over as a result of it. And I'm trying to figure out how crazy I'm willing to get because I have family in the area. I could put my stuff in storage for a couple months. And I believe the law in Virginia basically says if we don't agree to a new rent, I either have to vacate in 30 days, which would be the end of July or we have to come to an agreement and they're going to budge or I'm not going to agree to it. I'm not, I'm not going to take that hit. I, if, if I have to, I'll move out, I'll pay the movers, I'll put the stuff in storage and I'll take some extra trips with the saved money. So we'll, we'll see. We're, we're in a game of chicken right now. I'm just surprised that you wrote back to them upon receiving this new lease and they haven't said anything to you since then. Unless yes. they're like hard at work behind the scenes trying to craft something, but I doubt that's not. the case. No, they're definitely not. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to put some pressure on it to make a decision. Because even if we are going to come to an agreement, that's fine, but I don't want to pack all my stuff this month right? For, for that purpose and then have that be the result. But either way, I'm going to start packing because I'm moving either now or in the next couple of months. So I'm going to start kind of shutting down my my current operation here. Yeah, well, that's exciting. It's yeah. good to have new walls to look at every now and then. We'll, we'll keep everybody posted on where I actually live for, for any period of time. But it would be fascinating to have to stay with family for like a month or two just to, just to basically, I mean, I could go to an Airbnb as well. That's probably, it wouldn't save me money if I did that. In my mind, this is way more fun if I can like turn it into a surprise cash inflow or like take a cool trip with the savings of not paying this rent for a couple months, if he tries to really screw me on it. Yeah. I think they think they're holding the cards and what they don't know is that you have other options. I absolutely have other options. And now 
because it's gotten combative and they've pissed me off, I'm excited about the other options. I'm not, I'm not even at the point where I'm like, oh man, I might have to do this. This would be such a drag. I'm like pumped to, to basically throw it back in their face. I don't know what they've ignited in me because I'm normally a pretty agreeable guy, but I think the way they've done business just makes me really mad. Just be straightforward with people. There's no need for this. I'm very excited, but I'm sure I'm being set up for disappointment because I was also very excited about the tow truck story and a day in court, which never came. Uh, so it, it never came because I talked to a family friend that's an attorney and they basically said the most I would get back is basically what I paid in the towing fee. They, they thought that I couldn't prove any real damages because no, there were no real damages other than like my cost of an Uber. So if, if I thought that I could have gotten like a punitive ruling where like it actually hurt them a little bit to have towed me, I think I would have gone through with it. I, I gave up on that one because of this. So you're right. This is the second fight I've picked in like the last year. You're not hunting for moral victories here. I, you know, I guess I, I shouldn't say I picked a second fight. I didn't pick this fight. I think they picked this fight. They did. You just like ignited it a little more. Yeah, no, I, I, I responded pretty aggressively. Um, and basically threatened the landlord, not like physically, but I basically was like, no, if you think that you're going to ru run a truck over me with, with kind of how you're going to do this rent. Cause I have don't, I don't have options. That's not going to be what happens next. I, I got really fired up about it. I anyway, like it. That's not what our show's about today. Our show's about our listeners today. It's a mailbag episode. Uh, we got some fun feedback on the Beach Reads episode. We got some fun f feedback on Bobby Bonilla Day. So thanks to everybody that listened to those and wrote in. We appreciate it. Yeah, truly. I think people took my challenge to engage with us more seriously. We got a great influx of comments from people, emails, stuff on our Instagram. So we appreciate it. Keep yeah. it coming. It helps us to know that people do care about the show. And that, that's not like me grabbing for attention, but I think the engagement really helps us to know like what people want to hear about, what they're dealing with, and hopefully craft our content and messaging and, and keep it as, as engaging as possible for everybody. So um, with that in mind, let's get into a couple of emails that we got. The first one was a book suggestion. And I think, I think I intentionally left this one off, uh, not as a slight to him, but our friend Ernie wrote in and said he was surprised that we didn't talk about Morgan Housel's Same as Ever. Um, which was Morgan's second book after The Psychology of Money. First of all, Morgan, I, I, I think The Psychology of Money is still one of my favorite personal finance books. Like if you were only ever going to read one, that would probably be the one that I would say to read. And I've sent it to people. I have talked about it on the show. Morgan's been on the show. Same as ever, I thought was a little bit interesting. I think it's just as timeless, but I didn't find it as actionable in how I think about stuff. I think it was just kind of a framing of how I see the world which I do agree with a lot of it. Yeah, I haven't read that one yet. It's in the queue. In my snark, we got this email. I said, we left it off because we asked Morgan to come back on the show and he basically kicked the can on us. So no more free promo for Morgan Housel. But of course, we love his work. We've yeah. talked about this book and the psychology of money many times on the program. So it's a great suggestion. Yeah, my favorite takeaway, I think, from Morgan's book was the concept of save like a pessimist, invest like an optimist. I, th I think if there was one nugget from it, that would be my takeaway. But I do find a lot of the stuff about human behavior, like we tend to under, we do tend to underrate problems until we've had them ourselves, right? Like you could hear me talking on this podcast about all these home ownership problems. And you're like, I've never had any of that. Every rental I've ever done has been completely on the up and up. Landlords have never tried to screw me. Maybe Ross is just a weirdo. Like, no, I'm not. This has been bad for me. Uh, I don't <laughs> like renting. I'm excited to be out of here. Anyway, but I do find a lot of that behavioral stuff to be resonant and true for me, but it wasn't quite as actionable, I think, as the first book. Yeah, I, th I think he has great nuggets. He actually has a great podcast too uh, in very small digestible episodes of like 10 to 15 minutes where he offers a lot of the same quips of wisdom there, which I've been listening to as well. But yeah, same as ever, available everywhere. All right, let's get into a more intricate question. This comes to us from Michael, who wrote, in, who wrote in and said, he is the power of attorney for his mother's accounts. She turns 81 this weekend. Happy birthday to Michael's mom. Uh, it's probably just happened, actually, since uh, of when we're recording this. She has an IRA and an annuity. The IRA has got about 60K in it. 
question is, how do I know how much to take out for a required minimum distribution? And then she says, I don't think the annuity is tax sheltered. If it is not tax sheltered, there's no RMD. Correct. Uh, that's Michael's question. So how do you figure out the RMD? And then what is the deal with the annuity, assuming it is not tax sheltered, which is a big assumption. You got to make sure that it's not. But Dan, let's yeah. talk about the RMD first. All right. So truthfully, I think the easiest way to figure out the RMD is to go to an online calculator. There are a lot of good ones out there. Most of the big brokerage houses will have them. Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard probably all have their own RMD calculator. And you'll just answer the questions about her. You'll need the account balance from the year end of last year. So your the RMD you take this year in 2024 will be based on the balance as of December 31st, 2023. So that's important to know. You'll need that information, her date of birth, and it will calculate it for you. If you want to spot check that or do it manually, there is a table that the IRS puts out with different factors for different ages to determine the RMD number. So you would go find the right table. This is unnecessarily complicated, but there are a couple tables. You find the right one for her, go to her age and find what the factor is. You'll take the balance from the end of last year, divide it by that factor, and that should give you your RMD as well. Ideally, the online calculator will be the same as the manual calculation you do, and you'll know what to take out. Yeah, so I'm on the Schwab RMD calculator right now. That's probably the one I would use, not because I think it's particularly insightful. Ultimately, this is a pretty simple math problem, but I do think the Schwab RMD calculator works really well. It's simple in terms of what it asks. It's going to ask, it says your date of birth, but in this case, you're obviously going to put in your mom's account balance as of December 31. So that's the tricky number that you have to get right, is that it's based on that final day of the trading year for the calendar, right? So we going back and looking at that statement is the only tricky part. That's the stuff we can't know from the way the question is asked. But if it was 60,000, for example, and she was born on July 5th, 1943, the RMD would be $3,092.78, right? So that's how you're going to figure out is just plug those things in. And then it's going to ask who's the beneficiary, because if your spouse is 10 years older than you, that, or excuse me, 10 years younger than you, then you're going to have a slightly different calculation. They use a different table for that. But yeah, that, that's the easiest way to do it. On the annuity, I would just double check. I would look at the statement and make sure it's not an IRA annuity. Because you can have an annuity in an IRA. That sounds like it's not the case, but it absolutely happens. So double check the statement, make sure that it's not inside an IRA. But if it is a non-qualified annuity, which means that it is kind of an after-tax or non-IRA annuity, then no, there's no RMD on it. I would say at, at 81, if you haven't turned the annuity on, I would question what it's there for. What 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 are we guaranteeing in terms of income if we haven't turned it on at, at 81, but um, there shouldn't be a requirement there? Yeah. Qualified is the word I would look for because technically annuities are tax sheltered. So if you ask someone the question like that, it's possible you'll get a confusing answer. We want to know whether it is a qualified annuity, in which case we would likely need to be taking an RMD, or if it is a non-qualified annuity, like Ross said, in which case there is no RMD distribution requirement. Right. So normally on an annuity, it is tax sheltered in the sense that the taxes are deferred, right? So when you put the money in, you don't pay taxes as it grows. You pay them on distribution. So yes, there is a tax shelter component to it um, that, that is inherent in any annuity. Yeah. A lot of considerations for what sounds like a fairly simple question, right? Always. Nothing should be so simple. All right, Dan, let's go to the one. I think uh, somebody wrote this indirectly to you because they were talking about all sorts of stuff that you did this summer, like your trip to Harper's Ferry. Here was the question, though. They like when you and I take debates on the pros and cons. And in this case, in particular, it is a mortgage recast. So they have a 15-year mortgage at 2.25%. Awesome. is awesome. Super low. That's cheap money. They have 13 years left on it. So we're two years in. And if they find themselves with a big lump sum of money and they could pay it down so that there's only a tiny bit of the mortgage left, 
The question is, should they recast the mortgage? So they owe 440 on it right now. Having a lower, easily manageable monthly payment would allow them to live comfortably and invest the money that they're saving. I know there's probably some reasons not to do a mortgage recast, but I don't know what they are. So that's what we're talking about. So Dan, first of all, we haven't talked, we haven't pre-talked no. about this question. Right. Do you have an instinct on, on would you rather be pro or against the mortgage recast? I'm going to do whatever you don't do. How about that? Well, the, the question came to you. So I, I was going to give you first crack at, at it. I, I, would, I would be happy to argue either way. All right. Let's so do it on the spot debate. All right. I don't know that this is what I would ultimately do, but here's what I would say. What a mortgage recast allows you to do is squash your monthly payment. Yeah. Let's define a recast first. Yeah. So let's say I have a mortgage. I'm able to put a large chunk down against that mortgage balance. And then if I don't do anything, if I don't recast my mortgage, I'm going to keep paying my monthly mortgage payment that I was doing before. And I'll just finish it early, potentially. If I recast the mortgage, they say, okay, here's your new principal balance. Let's readjust your payment downward so that you get to pay it off in the same time frame that you had originally, the same 15-year window. That's essentially what it's doing. Are you pro? Or do, yeah, you got to pick a side, Dan. I'm going to say I'm pro. If, it always depends. But right now I'm pro. And here's why. When we're looking at retirement, retirement is a cash flow problem. I need to get enough coming in to replace what I was doing when I was working to cover my lifestyle expenses. If you have a large sum of money, sum of money like this that you can put towards the mortgage and can recast it, you've solved that problem at least part in part. Because I don't need to figure out how to get this extra cash from my investment accounts to pay down what is probably one of your largest monthly expenses. You've solved that for you. You've introduced some peace of mind. You have a lower hurdle to get past each month during retirement with things that have to be spent. This can make a much easier retirement journey for you because, because of that alone, right? You don't have to figure out what to sell, when to sell, how to transfer it in, how to deal with the taxes associated with it. Your cost of living has, in, in effect, gone down. Okay, I'm going to take the other side. So what we're talking about here is the cheapest money that you're ever going to have access to in your likely life. You're never going to get access to that. Right now, I could put money in a FDIC-assured savings account and make five and a quarter percent in interest today. Now, that's not guaranteed. So if I wanted to lock in that return for a longer period of time, I might have to think about something like corporate bonds or something along those lines. But I believe that you could essentially lock in a 5% return today almost for that entire mortgage period. So if I had $300,000 come in from something and I was saying, should I pay down this two and a quarter percent money where I'm paying almost nothing in interest versus earn 5% on my money with a limited amount of risk, I'm not, I'm not doing the recast. I'm just not going to do it, right? So if I had $300,000 and I'm, I'm doing that because they said maybe they could pay off like two thirds of the mortgage. So I'm just giving a rough estimate of what that would be. At 5%, I can make $15,000 a year in interest. Now that's taxable interest. So the taxes matter. We still got to look at that. Um, so, you know, maybe we're talking about 10 to 12,000 net of taxes is what's coming in. You can use that to offset your mortgage payment and still do the exact same thing you were thinking of doing, which is accelerating your savings or accelerating your investing. Cause now you're offsetting it with a higher yielding asset. Why would I recast such cheap debt if I can earn more than that on keeping the money in my pocket? Well, the FDIC insured accounts are going to adjust downward in almost real time as interest rates drop. No question. That's a risky proposition. And corporate debt, I believe, has also dropped double-digit percentages a couple of years ago when the interest rates went sky high. So those aren't as safe as some people are led to believe. Holding long-dated bonds has created a lot of pain for people over the last few years. So well, not it's without risk. pain in price action. Yeah, no, it's not without risk. There's no question. But if you're going to hold those bonds to maturity, who, who cares about the price action? And most of that negative price action, by the way, is because interest rates went up. So the same, if, if that's what happens, if interest rates go up and your bond portfolio gets crushed, then your short-term savings account's only going to do better. So if that's your view, 
then absolutely you should keep the money in the shortest dated interest bearing thing that you possibly can. But I don't think that's where we are today. I think most bond managers today are trying to extend their duration so that they can take advantage of these higher rates and kind of feast on them a little bit longer. So that would be the side I'm on. So if we're peeling back the curtain, I tend to be on your side. I will say though, for the brewery, we recently recast a mortgage too, because again, it's an opportunity cost of the use of capital. So if I can reduce my monthly outflow and use those dollars effectively elsewhere, typically to reinvest in the business in that case, in your personal life, perhaps there's more you want to do that you're being limited on from having such a high loan payment. A recast can be very attractive. I, I really appreciate that we can immediately jump into that debate. I did not feel strongly about the answer until I started speaking, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I, by the time I was done giving that answer, I feel emphatically that I would not recast this mortgage if I had a bunch of cash sitting around today. I mean, I love a two and a quarter percent loan. I don't even need a reason to spend it now. If you gave it to me, I'd take it. Right. If, yeah, if, if you, exactly. I, I would take that loan from you today and, and yeah, that's fine. I'll pay it back over 15 years. That's fine. What you could even do is, is just sit on the fence, right? Like if you were going to put the money in a high yield savings account and park it, and when interest rates drop and it no longer becomes attractive to keep the money parked, then you pay the loan down. Um, yeah. That, that's yes. the best answer, by the way. Yeah, you could, you could you could do that too. So yeah, if you wanted to stay on the short end of the curve and just you know eat while the eating's good kind of thing, like you can you could absolutely do that and and sit on the fence with it too. I think I would probably still ladder those bonds out and you know try and earn the the higher yield. Yeah, the numbers matter. I think it's worth doing the calculations and seeing what's best for you. Like, what would you actually save with the number that you could potentially put towards the mortgage? Where would your payment go to? That matters too. Yeah. And what what would that mean for you? Does that make a difference in your life? Yeah. And and what does the liquidity look like? And in a real planning situation, that's the thing that we're really solving for is what is the rest of your cash flow need, right? Like if you think about how many mortgage payments you could make with that $300,000, that could give you plenty of runway to live without paying down the debt. But if you put all that money into the equity of the home, which is really what making that recast or just a huge payment would do, you know, that, that means you're, you're locking that up and you don't have access to it. So yeah, it's, it's not as simple as just those two things, but I, I like the debate. So thank you for writing in and, and hopefully we gave you some things to think about there. All right. One last question for today's show. This came into us from Marty. He's been a regular listener for one and a half years. It's crazy. We've been doing this show for what, three years now, Dan, a little, or, little more than that. It's been a while. Yeah. I, I, I'm amazed how many people have been listening for that long. Really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Three Mark. and a half, three and a half years. Okay. Bananas. So here's what Marty said. He joined a company in a senior management role and they do not have a safe Harbor 401k. He maxes out his contributions into a traditional IRA and does catch up contributions into a Roth IRA because he's 58. So you can do the catch up. Anyone over 50 can do the catch up at the end of the year. He received a check back from the program of $5,000 without giving it much thought. I opened a new IRA at Schwab and invested the dollars. Then I started thinking about the taxes. The communication with the check was that no revised tax forms would be issued. So three questions. Number one, was the refund of the pre-tax dollars he contributed, were they returned with the taxes withdrawn already? And how will that impact future taxes? Number two, was putting the returned funds in a new brokerage account, a traditional IRA, the right move? And number three, should he cut off his contributions this year once he hits the max and just deposit those, those dollars after tax into a new IRA? Dan, I was a little confused by the question. I think I follow. I'm going to say this is quite a pickle. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying that. So let's define a couple terms and then I'll explain what I think is being asked here. All right. So it looks like he joined a company where they do not have a safe harbor 401k. What is a safe harbor 401k? Well, a four, 401k plan in theory needs to undergo a lot of testing to make sure that it doesn't disproportionately favor like executive, executive level roles, highly compensated employees and all that stuff. Basically, are people using this plan beyond the highly compensated people. Did if it's the rich skewed, people set up a, a safe haven for themselves at the exclusion of everybody else that works here. Correct. 
One way to avoid that testing is by instituting a safe harbor plan, which essentially means you're matching people's contributions or making contributions on their behalf. If you do that, you avoid a lot of the testing that goes through otherwise, and your plan gets the check mark because they say, all right, well, you're offering incentive to everyone to participate. Like, this is fine. It looks like they do not have that. In which case, at the end of the year, they run through this testing. If they determine that there is some sort of violation or something not kosher here, they might return contributions to people that constitute the excess that was allowable under the plan. So it sounds like Marty got a check back that said, this is what you could not contribute based on the testing. Here you go. Right. Do, do we agree with that so far? I, yes, I, I think that's what happened. All right. Number one. If that was a pre-tax contribution and a return of that, that will be adjusted on your pay. Exactly how that materializes, I would contact the payroll department, but typically they might issue an amended W-2 because you you were not entitled to that deduction based on that 401k contribution anymore. So if you filed your taxes already, you might need to amend them, but you need to figure out exactly how that flowed through, but it, it is relevant. It does matter. Yeah, because basically at the end of the year, when you look at your W-2, it shows what your total compensation was and then also what you put into employer-sponsored retirement plans. So if you were over because of the testing, then on that form that you correctly either gave to your CPA or stuck into TurboTax or whatever you're doing for your taxes, you gave yourself credit for that deduction. Now they're right. kicking that back to you which means that your forms that you already filed are basically wrong. All right. Now, what he says he did is he turned around and deposited those dollars into a new traditional IRA, which in theory could provide another tax deduction for those same dollars, right? But it sounds like he's over the earnings limit to deduct it. Correct. That, that's my sense too. So there are two things that happen when you want to make a deductible contribution to a traditional IRA. Number one, it matters whether or not you are covered by an employer-sponsored plan of any kind, and then your earnings matter too. So my sense is it's very likely that you could not make a deductible contribution to a traditional IRA in this instance, uh, but it's worth checking just to make sure. So that's that could be a problem. Yeah, and he, and he mentioned that they were already maxing out IRA contributions. So that that's where I was confused. Is, is this in addition to an other another IRA because you can't you can't make a second IRA contribution just because you have a second plan. Yeah. Right? I, that, I that wonder if of, of eight or seven thousand for the year and then with the catch up is for the year. That doesn't matter how many accounts you have. Yeah. I wonder if he meant he was maxing out the 401k. That that would make sense to me. But if it were the IRA then right, you can't max out different IRAs. He says he does not qualify for the Roth here, which again goes to the point where I think income puts you above the threshold for being able to deduct a traditional IRA contribution. All right. Then, then the last question, should I cut off contributions once they hit the max and deposit those into a new IRA? One of the problems with a safe, with a non-safe harbor plan is you don't know where that limit's necessarily going to be each year. Right. If you want to raise the limit, what you should do is start a PR campaign inside the company and try and get everybody to contribute to the 401k. You actually need to raise everybody's contribution threshold. So you should start putting up flyers that says you're probably not saving enough. Everybody bump your, your percentage by 3% this year so that we can all put more in. Yeah. That's unlikely, oh, oh. by the way. That's a tongue-in-cheek suggestion. But, but really, that's, that's what has to happen is if it's not a safe harbor plan, you need more people particularly on the lower income earning segment of the employees to contribute a higher percentage. It's not the dollar amount they put in. It's the percentage of their income they put in. That's what moves the needle on what you're allowed to do on these tested plans. Yeah. Or, or advocate to make it a safe harbor plan. You know, I, I feel like HR teams tend to be responsive to stuff like this. I've seen clients of mine petition their HR teams to change plans, change fund options within the plan, all these different things that have ultimately taken place. Talking about a PR campaign, I, you know, we talked about my brewery's 401k plan a few episodes back, and I got texts from friends of ours who like couldn't believe how low participation was. I legitimately did walk through the brewery the other day, chastising people who weren't participating, telling them that we're giving them free money 
to put money into this plan, like don't give up free money. And hopefully I move the needle on a couple of people. You've become a free financial advisor for those folks, Dan. Good job. Un- unofficially, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so this question has a lot of nuance to it. A ton um, of stuff going on here. Yeah, I, I would talk to the to the HR team and payroll team regardless just to better understand what's happening with the plan. I think that's a valuable thing for you. Let's clear the I, brush for a second, Dan. If he can't deduct the contribution, do you like that he's making an after-tax contribution to an IRA? Because I don't. Uh, I don't love, I mean, again, I this is a broad general generalization. I hate, I went from don't love to hate after tax contributions. If you cannot then convert them to a Roth. Exactly. That's the only reason I would ever do it personally. It, it's messy. You have to track the basis forever. The way out is going to be annoying. It's my, I look for ways to reduce nuisance in my life. I like nuisance in some areas, but in the financial aspects of it, I would rather things be as simple and clean as possible. I don't want like a billion different qualifications on the dollars I have in different accounts. Yeah. I'm going to fight with my landlord, not with my IRA basis. This is (laughs) not a fight I want to have. The having to track the basis in your IRA, which basically remember, so if you put $5,000 into an IRA on an after-tax basis, that basis stays there forever. And every time you take a distribution from your IRA, some portion of what you take out is now going to be pre-tax dollars and some portion is going to be basis. And you have to keep track of that the whole time. Or the unintended consequence, if you lose track of it, is that you're just going to end up treating it all as income again in the future. And so you put after-tax dollars into an IRA they grew tax deferred and then you pay taxes on it again. The mistake here costs you double taxation. The only reason I use an after-tax IRA is if I can immediately and cleanly convert that money into a Roth for people. That's the in my view that's the only reason to do it. Other people may disagree and say, "Hey, you could get all this money in there and then yeah, but it, to me it's it's not worth it." And I view the growth on a brokerage account as likely more tax efficient than the growth in the IRA, right? So you've already paid taxes on the money. If you just put it into a brokerage account and you park the money in an S&P 500 index fund or whatever it is you're going to invest in, you're going to convert all the growth to long-term capital gains rates as long as you hold it for more than a year. It's flexible. It's low tax rates, certainly lower than whatever your income rate is. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I hate a non-deductible IRA. There we go. We've, we've made a definitive statement here on the show. Yeah. We, we didn't leave a lot of room open for interpretation there. So <laughs> if, if we understood the question correctly, sorry, I, I ended up on a soapbox. Apparently I'm still fired up from, from this landlord war. Um, yeah. So I, I hope that helps. I think we gotta, we gotta make sure your taxes are filed correctly we got to make sure that you're contributing in a reasonable way to the 401k plan, which it's annoying when you're limited like that. And you got you to gotta figure out what to do with those refunded proceeds. I would potentially back out that IRA contribution. Yeah, there's probably going to be a little paperwork over the next few weeks to make sure everything's looking good. But if you talk to the right people and know how to ask the questions, it should be all right. Yeah, we could, we could pull the string on all of these for very long just because... There is so much complexity. Q are ranting about how long the tax code is and why it doesn't need to be like that. But, you know, hopefully I love, we I love the questions. There, there was some meat on the bone in those questions. There was a lot of nuance that they seemed very simple, but there was a lot going on in this. Yeah, keep them coming. Check your balances at outlook.com until we change to a more official sounding email address. Uh, we love hearing from you. Thanks everybody for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next time.